Good morning. Man, that was, that was special, wasn't it? Um, you never have to go alone in this walk with God. Uh, it's why he puts us in a church family. It's why he makes us his people. Uh, and his gospel is so good, and so we're going to talk about it this morning. Um, we, we're starting a new series called The Fruits of the Spirit. And it's not a creative title. Uh, we're just walking right through Galatians chapter 5 and, and what the fruits of the Spirit are and Many of us today might have placed our faith in Christ, but how do we faithfully live in all that God has provided us by grace? How do we see the, uh, everything that we do through a lens of the gospel, that we might have joy in every circumstance, in every situation, and, and, and live faithfully to all that God has purchased for us on the cross? And, and that's what faithfulness is. We want to be a people who are able to, to live in the gospel in everything that we do, that we might have joy and life and satisfaction and reveal that he is the only thing worthy of all worship and praise in everything that we do. And so uh, we are going to start this morning as we walk through the fruits of the Spirit, um, not with the first fruit that's listed in the text, uh, but with faithfulness. And, and so we're, we're making this Fruits of the Spirit series part of our Advent series, and so we're going to save love, peace, and joy for December. Uh, so we're going to start with a foundational reality that we all need to be able to walk in, and that's faithfulness, to walk in the joy of who we are in Christ. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at two different texts, uh, and, and so we'll get to those in just a moment. Galatians chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 16. Through 26 is where the fruits of the Spirit are listed out. And so we're going to do a couple of things this morning. Don't, don't get worried about the time, uh, but we're actually going to have an intro to the fruits of the Spirit and then talk about faithfulness and how those two intermingle in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is so important for us to see. And so we'll be in Galatians 5 and then 2 Timothy chapter 2. And so you can kind of put a place marker in your Bible in those two places. But this is important because the church full of the Holy Spirit, listen, is the most powerful, special, life-giving entity on planet earth. But a church that is led and walks in the flesh is perhaps the most damaging entity on earth, the most misleading entity on earth. So it's not only important for us as followers of Christ to walk in faithfulness to who we are in Christ, but it's also important for the church body to realize how we walk in faithfulness to Christ so that we might reveal him and the joy that we have in him and all that we do. So today I've said this in the first service and it, it almost worked out. So I'm going to say it to kind of hold myself to it in this service as well. Um, my plan is, even though we're going over two different things, uh, to get us out a little bit uh, earlier than usual this morning. I, I'm not going to make that a promise, but I'm just throwing it out there so that maybe I'll hold to it a little bit. Um, I know that pro we've, we've never, I don't know if you've noticed this before, but we've never announced an ending time for our services ever. It's just a start time. If you come to the nine o'clock, you know you at least have a cap, all right? <laughs> Uh, but, but this one is just all, all, you know, everything's wide open. And so, um, but we've never done that. We have an internal clock and the, the internal clock that we kind of, the goal we set as a church body as leaders, um, I think I've probably gone past maybe the last 150 weeks in a row, uh, or, or however long our church has been in existence. So today there, there's a challenge for me to get you guys out a little bit earlier, but, but I want us to, to just rest in the truth of God's word. I want us to be, I think it's been probably maybe a difficult week uh, for all of us, regardless of what direction you were looking for in the election. It's just been a weird week. Uh, you've gotten through it physically. I don't know how you feel emotionally, uh, but I believe that the gospel will, will fill us up this morning and give us, give us life. And so let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this time that we have together. We ask that everything that, that is said would glorify and honor you. God, we don't need to hear from me. We need to hear from you. And so, Father, I pray that everyone here today, everybody that might be watching online, God, that you would, if they don't know you, if their faith has not been placed in you, then today would be the day that they would place their faith in you, that they would know freedom for the very first time, that you would draw them unto yourself, and that they would know that what they are placing their faith in actually has the ability to fulfill everything that they need for it to and long for it to. God, for those of us who know you, I pray that you would deepen our faith and allow us to walk faithfully in the fruit of the Spirit that you have provided for us by your grace. 
And so, God, I pray that you would just uh, allow us to hear from you. I pray that everywhere that your word is proclaimed today, that you would add into your church, that you would build up your church body. We pray for the church of our city. God, we're not the only thing that is happening in Winston-Salem. We are just a part of what you are doing, and we are thankful to be whatever part you may allow us to play. But we understand and desire that you would move through your entire church. And so, God, we give this time to you and pray these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. Faithfulness, I don't know if you've noticed this in, in your life, but, but faithfulness is something that I feel like is, is a word similar to the word love that's lost a little bit of weight in our culture, uh, maybe in, in your own personal life as well. L- love is used in so many different ways in our language that we really don't really know what anybody's talking about when they use it, unless, it's, unless we kind of try to put it in context. So the word doesn't carry a whole lot of weight. The context and the way that you use it does. And so I can be sitting across the table from my wife enjoying a bowl of ice cream, and I can look at my ice cream and say, I love this ice cream. And then I can look up at my wife and go, and I love you too. <laughs> like the same word. And hopefully, like I love my wife a little bit more than the ice, like you can tell in the context of maybe the way I say it. But, but the, the weight of the word love isn't there. It's in the context in which we use it. And there's a misunderstanding of even that word in our culture. And so uh, we oftentimes forget in our culture that love is defined outside of our own feelings, outside of our own desires, that God is actually love. And in him we can know love, but outside of him we're just kind of chasing after our own lusts. And so the the way that we even use that word in our culture has lost a whole lot of meaning and weight. And faithfulness is is kind of the same. It's a lost virtue. And and some of that is dependent on the way that we see love. And and it kind of reflects on faithfulness in the way that we see love in our community. But some of it is just that, that we honestly just view faithfulness in such a way in our culture that it that it doesn't really it doesn't really, it's not something that we feel like we need to pursue. Like faith in our culture and our society as a whole is something we feel like we've almost gotten past. And so faith in general, let alone faithfulness, is, is something that we just feel like, man, let's just reason our way through everything we should believe. Faith is a weakness. We've moved past it as, as a people. And, and in the church, we don't even really put as much weight because we're influenced by the cultural view of faith and faithfulness. We don't maybe put as much weight on it as maybe we should, or maybe there's a misunderstanding in how we should be faithful to God. And so even when we in the church hear things like God is faithful, there might be some confusion and kind of feeling in our heart of, I'm not really sure what that means. Like, I, get, I believe it, but it, it doesn't necessarily affect the way that I live every single day and every thought that I have, that, that God is faithful. And I struggle with trying to understand that. And then maybe you've grown up in church. If you haven't, that's totally fine. And in some ways, uh, you probably have an advantage in understanding the gospel in, in many different ways. But if you've grown up in, in the church and, and you've heard somebody just say that, don't you want to hear God say that, good, well done, my good and faithful servant? And you're just kind of like, okay, so I'm struggling with this idea of God's faithfulness. And then I'm like, how, do I, how am I supposed to live in that faithfulness that I struggle understanding in such a way that he says, well done at the end of my days? Um, and then there used to be songs that we would sing in church. And if you've grown up in church, maybe you'll, you'll, you'll remember this one. But that it would just stir our souls towards faithfulness. And we would talk about faithfulness a lot in the church. We don't necessarily talk about it that much anymore. But I remember the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Anybody remember that song? Right? I would sing it, but then we would all just have to leave. Like nothing else that I would say would matter, right? We wouldn't be able to hear any of it. We'd just be totally grossed out. Um, but, but the words were, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And our souls would just be stirred on the faithfulness of God and, and, our, and our ability by his grace to walk in the faith that he has given us, to, to view everything in life through a lens of faithfulness to everything that we are in Christ. But now it seems very hard to, to really believe that in a way that, that transforms everything about. There's a disconnect I often feel. 
There's a disconnect in my own life that I feel. There's a disconnect in, in many of you as I talk with you and, and, and different church members about the faithfulness of God and our faithfulness to him and walking in him in every area of life and in everything that we think and everything that we process and everything that we see and all the activities that we pursue and live in. There's this disconnect, maybe not in belief, but in the, the transition uh, of life, the transformation of everything that we are at a heart level. We often, even as believers, mistake the environment that we are in for the presence and faithfulness of God. See, so the culture that we live in thinks faith is just something that we don't even need anymore, even though every single one of us puts our faith in something. We'll talk about that in just a second. But the church oftentimes misunderstands faith because we we, uh, mistakenly see the environment and the circumstances we are in as the faithfulness of God and not God who is faithful in any circumstance and environment. And so if everything's going really, really good for me, man, God is faithful. He is blessing. I can be faithful to him. This is easy, but it's, we can rarely call trusting God, trusting God when everything's just going easy and our environment is going really well, and our circumstances are going really well, and so we just say, oh, God is faithful, and I'm faithful to him. But when everything's not going well, then we're like, God, where are you? What are you doing? Are you being faithful? Can I trust you? I'm not sure. Maybe I need to figure out some of my own ways. So we often fall into this in the church, and what happens in, commu- in the society and culture is we're, we're not even sure we need faith anymore, though we desperately do, and we display that in everything that we put our trust in to, to meet the needs that we have and to gain what we are missing, and we're pursuing all of these things in faith that they will be able to fulfill us. But in the church, what we do is we mistake our circumstances and situations for the presence and blessing of God and whether or not we can trust him or not. And so we actually believe in our minds maybe that God is faithful, but in the way that we live, we compromise our faith. We compromise faithfulness, and we don't necessarily place all of our faith in God and what he has done, but we we kind of believe that he is faithful, but then in the way that we live, we believe that we have to be faithful to the things of the world to actually get everything that we long for and we're created for. And so many times in the church, we have kind of a, a foot in both sides. We have a foot in the culture. This is what the Bible would call the flesh. And then we have a foot in the spirit. That, that we're living in everything that God has created for us. So we place our faith in God and, and we kind of live on both sides. And, and so what we find ourselves doing is being faithful during the week, maybe, to the things of the world fulfilling us and then faithful on Sundays to the things of God fulfilling us. And, and it's just an absolutely confusing way to live. We're not completely faithless, but we're not really faithful. And so in the culture, oftentimes we see faithlessness. In the church, oftentimes we see a compromise. See, we can't have our foot in both places. Faithfulness to God is not giving him a little bit of our time, but it's using all of our time to, to, to go towards his glory and who we are in him. And so we need to discover this because it's very important for us as followers of Christ to live in the freedom that we have in God and everything that he has purchased for us to have joy and satisfaction and everything we long for in him and in him alone where is the only place that we can actually find it for us to not only place our faith in him and have salvation, but us also to live in faithfulness to what he has purchased for us by his grace that we might actually live in that joy of who we are in him. So so we cannot allow faithlessness or compromise to filter into our lives, but it so often does. Because in our culture, society today, isn't this kind of the way that we function? Like everything kind of causes us to, to, to lean towards compromise or faithlessness. Like, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I've been in life enough and I've experienced enough things to not really put too much hope in anything of the world, right? Like, I don't really, I have a problem with trust and I feel like it's because of experience, right? And so when it comes to things that we put our hope in, we we keep that bar pretty low. We're not really sure, is this really going to work? Like, is this place really going to be as good as all my friends said it was? Like, how many people have been told this? Hey, I will pay you back 
Yeah, sure, you're going to pay me back. Right? I'll pray for you. And, we're, and, and as believers, we're kind of just like, okay, well, I guess this is all that counts. I know you're not going to pray for me. Right? Or my favorite and every pastor's favorite, I think, is when we see somebody, a church member or attender during the week, and they're like, hey, I'll see you on Sunday. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> You'll probably be on time too, right? Um, and so, so there's just all of these doubts that we have all through everything that we face in the world. We, we don't really believe that, that there is a faithfulness to anything. There's, a, there's at very most a compromise and, 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 and most of the time a faithlessness. And this filters into the way that we even see God. Because we live in a culture that could be defined as unfaithful and a church that could be defined as compromising. So much so that we don't even think that much about it, do we? When somebody tells us something we know we're not gonna, they're not going to do, we don't really even consider it to be that bad of a thing. It's just normal. It's just what we all do. We tolerate it, and a lot of times we even understand it and we sympathize with it unfaithfulness to what is true and good and best is just normal. We see it all around us. We see politicians compromise for votes. We see people compromise loving other people for politicians. We see athletes compromise for victory. We see pastors compromise for status and influence and and church growth. We see dads and moms compromise their families for success. We are a culture, like it or not, that has become comfortable with compromise and unfaithfulness to what is actually good and to what is actually true. Ultimately, it's because even though we think we function in this pure reason that we no longer need faith in anything, and the foundational belief is whatever I want, I just need to chase after and get because certainly that is the next step in my satisfaction and joy and completement and fulfillment. This is the way that we think. Whatever I desire, whatever I long for, whatever I think I need, then that's the ultimate goal I need to pursue. Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist and professor of ethical leadership at NYU. I've, I've quoted him a few times. He's not a believer at all, um, but he has some really enlightening views and and ideas and how we think as a people. And he's done tons of research and written books on this. He says this, our moral decisions, the things that define why we are who we are, don't come from reason any longer. So there's no foundational truth under them, but rather from intuition. We don't have a system of beliefs based on any particular foundation in which we make a decision. We just feel, believe, And then act. And listen, when that selfishness defines who we are, that what I long for and desire, whatever intuition I have or feel for a need is is what I pursue after. And then we see it through a lens of selfishness. And that selfishness will will configure and determine how I actually chase after and get that thing then we never actually end up in the community that we want. We never actually end up finding everything that we want. We're just pursuing things with no foundational truth for if it will actually satisfy or if it will actually do what it says it will do or what we believe it might be able to do. Therefore, in our culture, though, the most wrong thing that we can possibly do is not just to chase after whatever we want, to pursue it. And we do have some cultural parameters on that. We don't want to just deliberately hurt other people. But we've already talked about how unfaithfulness and compromise is something that we tolerate and even sympathize with in our culture. So even though we do have parameters on what we will chase in our selfishness, we don't desire to hurt other people necessarily because we are all made in the image of God. That's written on our hearts, whether we believe it or not. When it comes to commitments, well, why would I make a commitment? That seems old-fashioned. When it comes to pursuing at any great lengths integrity in our life, well, what's the point? If I make a promise and, it, and it's helpful for me to fulfill that promise, then I'll do it. But if I make a promise and it's not helpful for me to actually fulfill it when it comes time to fulfill it, then I won't. And most of us live in this realm, even if we're not putting that kind of weight on it, it might just be that we kind of do it subconsciously. I made a promise or a commitment that I would do something, and then when it comes time to do it, you know what, I'm kind of just tired. They'll understand. 
right? And so we live in this world where we make commitments, we make promises, and then we only fulfill them or live out those commitments if it actually works well for us. And we do this in our society because we have no settled reason outside of faithfulness to God to live in a certain way. See, God created us to live in a certain way, to experience him in a certain way, to have community with him and find life and joy in him in the way that he created us to live. But outside of him, there's no tethered particular good or truth or morality to be faithful to. So we're simply faithful to self. And it never produces what we want. It leads us into all kinds of things that never get us to everything that we long for and desire or the culture that we desire to be a part of. Society just goes out of whack when this is the way that we live. Faithfulness to complete autonomy is actually unfaithfulness to the truth. And so when we're faithful to self alone, we're actually moving away from everything we were created for for and long for. So we can pursue it with all that we are, but we're never going to find it. We'll actually get further from it. And so anger and depression and anxiety and fear and all of these different kinds of things will begin to dominate us individually in our culture. Marriages will be broken more and more because if I'm not finding faithfulness in God, then I'm not in a covenant in a marriage with another person, but I'm actually using the person that I'm married to to complete me in a way that I'm not already fulfilled, which only God can do. But if I find my identity in God, then I can be married to someone in a way that I don't need to find something or get something out of them or to perform for them for them to get something out of me contractually. But I'm already fully who I am and satisfied in Christ. And therefore, I can just reveal with this person that I'm married to through a covenant love with them based on who I am in Christ and not who they are towards me. And I can reveal that I am satisfied and whole. And then marriage can begin to reflect what it's supposed to reflect. But if it's contractual and I need you to fulfill me in some way, then what we will see is marriages splitting more and more. We see children who are left alone and fatherless more and more in our community as we walk away from faithfulness to God and what is true. We end up not with this utopia that we all seek, but actually getting closer and closer to the hell we face without God. Our sinful hearts are defining what we are faithful to, not God and being faithful to him. And listen to me, when we look down deep into our hearts we don't actually find the answers to our problems like our society believes that we do. But what we actually find the deeper we look into our heart is the cause of all of our problems. See, there's a reason in scripture that God never puts the word self before he puts the word discovery. He always puts the words die to before he uses the word self. Because we're not created to find life in and of ourselves or to selfishly pursue everything that we think we long for and want. But we're created to find life and satisfaction in him and in him alone. We were created to desire life in him. And when we walk away from him, we're actually walking away from everything that we want. And so here's what I need us to know when we're talking about faithfulness and what we actually were created to be faithful to. It means that as we walk through our our own desires and what scripture calls the flesh, we will have to say some profound no's to things that we think we really, really need. And we will have to look to God and what he says is best and walk in faithfulness to who he is. See, when he actually uh, came down and lived, Jesus lived and, and, and lived the perfect life on our behalf and died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin and rose from the grave to overcome sin and death so that by grace we might be saved. By placing our faith in him, he's actually taking us who have rebelled against him and selfishly sought our own ways and made our own, built our own kingdoms and made our own religious ways to pl- place faith in and live faithfully to to try to get what only he can give. And he brings us back into community with him by his grace grace by his work and his work alone and then by his grace we can begin to live in that identity that he has given us that's what we want to discover in this text and and i believe here at the end of the year 2020 when everything has just gone absolutely nuts it is the perfect time for us to evaluate ourselves for us to evaluate the church what is our faith in 
What, are, what is our faithfulness in? What are we living in faith towards? And so these are the questions that we want to ask because, listen, every single one of us has faith. And every single one of us is faithful to what we put our faith in. We believe and live in such a way that we trust something to fulfill us, that we depend on something, that we're reliant on something, that we're, our, we have convictions in which, which form the way we walk and, and the lens in which we form those convictions and we rely on and we trust something. That is something that we're placing faith in to fulfill us. And then faithfulness is being true to that faith allowing it to determine the way that we make all of our decisions and the way that we walk through life. And as we said, the Bible gives us two options for where we put our faith and faithfulness, the flesh and the spirit. Now, we might say, if we were just to go around the room and, and kind of take a survey of everybody, that we struggle with putting our faith in all sorts of, there might be a hundred different ways that we say we struggle to put our faith in different things. But ultimately, if we're putting our faith in anything of the world or self, then we're putting our faith and we're living faithfully to things of the flesh, things that cannot provide. Or we can put our faith in the spirit, the things of God, who he is, what he has done. His work on our behalf, and by grace we are saved and set free in Him. But ultimately, Scripture is very clear. There are only these two options. And, we, and, and I know a lot of times as Christians, as I said, we like to try to put one foot on both sides, but that's not the way it works. That's compromise. It's not true faithfulness. Ultimately, that type of compromise is actual faithfulness to the flesh and not to God. And if your faithfulness is found in the flesh, then you're not pursuing joy at all. You're walking away from it. And so what I want us to see in Galatians chapter 5 is this idea of the fruit of the Spirit. What is it like to walk in the Spirit, to put our faithfulness in who we are in God? We cannot have two different operating systems that we operate on. It's the flesh or it is the Spirit. And Paul points this out to us in the book of Galatians. So turn there. Look in chapter 5, and I'm going to read verse 1, and then I'll jump down to verse 16. I want us to see this. For the freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So hang on right there one second, because what Paul is saying is that in the gospel truth, we are actually set free by grace, by God's work alone, to walk in the way that God has created us to walk, to have community with him, to live for our joy, not out of duty, in everything that he has designed us to do and in every way that he has designed us to live. He allows us to live in faithfulness to what is actually true and good. But if we're walking in the things of the world and in the flesh, then we are actually enslaved to the things of the world. And I want us to understand that. That if we're walking in things of the world, I'm trying to find or complete myself or accomplish an identity that is missing in me by relationships, then I will be enslaved to that relationship. I have to have it. I have to build it. I have to pursue it. I have to get out of it what I long for. If I'm, if I'm finding my identity in what I do, then I've got to have success and I cannot lose that success. And it just creates anxiety and anger and fear and worry and all the things that we were talking about a few minutes ago. But if I find my fullness and satisfaction in God, where fullness and satisfaction are, I'm brought back into community with him that I was created to have, and I'm fully satisfied and whole in who I am in him, and I understand how to walk in the freedom that he has created me for and designed me for, then suddenly I'm set free from finding myself where I work or finding myself in relationships, and now I'm free to reveal who I am in God in my workplace and in my relationships. I don't have to worry or fear losing or worry or fear not gaining, but I'm absolutely free to live in the identity I have in Christ in those situations. This is what Paul points out. And then he lays out in the coming verses the difference between living under the law and living by grace. And then look at verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So there's a transformation there. 
That if we have placed our faith in Christ, then God is working in me. The Spirit is living and dwelling in me, God's Word says. And it's transforming in my heart to change my desires, change my longings. Uh, One of the greatest misconceptions that I come across all the time with people is this idea that if I place my faith in Christ, I'm going to have to give up all the things in my life that I find joy in. And it's absolutely false. God will begin to transition the things that you thought were bringing you joy, but you were enslaved to, and he will begin to free you from needing to find joy in those things so that you can actually enjoy the things that are good for his glory. See, he sets us free to walk in him and not the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For those who are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, listen to this, are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and just in case we don't fall under one of those categories, things like these. I warn you, as I, uh, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So those who find their life, their identity, they put their faith in those things satisfying them and those things being what they need will not be in community with God. They will not be set free in him. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. There's freedom. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. There's a transformation. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. All right, something I want us to see in this text. All right, one, we've already talked about, and so we're not going to spend any more time on it, but we need to understand this idea between the flesh and the Spirit. That we all live in two different realms, the visible realm and the spiritual or unseen realm. That we are both body and soul. One philosopher and theologian, J.P. Moreland, I would recommend any of his, his readings. They're pretty heady, but, um, but he describes it like this. He, he asks the question, where do I actually define who I am? And his illustration is a little bit gory and gross, but maybe that's why I like it. What he says is, if I was to take every part of of my body, the physical part of me, every atom, every cell, every muscle, every bone, and we just spread it out all over the floor, piece by piece, that's the gross part, then then he says, what part of that would define who I am? And the point that he's trying to make is, we are body and we are also soul, we are spirit. And, and God created both of those, the soul eternal to be with him for all of eternity, the body, the flesh, to be here on earth to, to worship and to glorify him. And he created us for both body and soul to be for his glory, to reveal him, to have joy in him. And so at creation, both body and soul, we're in community with God. We revealed him, we worshiped him, we had joy in him and him alone. This is what we were made for, to give him glory. But just as we sinned and rebelled and walked away from him seeking our own way, so did an angel that we refer to as Satan. He falls away and rebels against God before we do. He desires to be God rather than to worship God. And what God does, and we can't get super deep into this, but he sends him out of heaven because nothing, no sin, no brokenness can be in the presence of God who is perfect and holy and pure. So he sends the enemy sin, evil, to the earth for a time. Now, what we also need to know is that just as God has, has sent the enemy, Satan, evil out of heaven, he will also one day send him out of earth. But in this time, there is an evil in us and an evil around us that the Bible refers to as the flesh. 
Then there is the spirit, is the things of God and who we were created to be and the community we were created to have with him that we had at creation. And what we need to understand is that Satan, the enemy, evil, it has a culture that it produces and God, goodness, life, joy, holiness, righteousness, it has a culture that it produces. There is a culture in the kingdom of heaven, and there is a culture in the flesh that evil has its hands all over. And what Paul tells us in the book of Galatians is the culture of heaven is everything that we want and pursue. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Which he says, all lead us to freedom. Against such, there is no law. We are completely free when we are defined by these things because it's everything that we were created to know and be defined in and have communion with God and to worship him in and to give glory to him in. But there's also a culture of the world, a culture of the flesh. And Paul tells us that the culture of the flesh is sexual immorality, idolatry, religion without Christ. That's what sorcery is. Strife. Envy, jealousy, unrighteous anger, rivalry, dissension, division, drunkenness, or orgies, or maybe a better way to think about that is self-gratification and numbing agencies. And then he says, and the like. Listen to me, is that not what we kind of see in our culture? Is it not everything that we're also fighting against? Even if we can participate in those things, we're not doing them in the right way. And so Paul gives us these three categories of what the culture of the world is. And he says there are three things that we are absolutely confused in and do not understand what to pursue and how to live when we find ourselves in the culture of the flesh. He says there's sexual confusion. That's the category number one. There's spiritual confusion and there's social confusion. These are three categories that we live in. Everything we look right or left in our culture and society are defined by the cultures of the flesh. We're seeking everything in the kingdom of God. We want love and peace, and pe- but we can't find it. Why? Because we're finding our faith in pursuit of and faithfulness of the things of the world. And, and the two will not meet together, and we cannot find and live in both sides. And so without placing our faith in the reality that Christ came and lived and died and rose and finding our identity fully encapsulated in who we are in him, then we will never have the right faith, and we will never be faithful to the right things. The things that we long for and desire will never be fulfilled. So we need to understand this is what we see In scripture, this is this idea between the flesh and the spirit. And to live in the flesh, listen to me, is simply the independent coping strategy that we use to try to get through life without God. It's just what we try to do because we don't know where to place our actual faith. And it's not equal and it's not a good substitute. It's a counterfeit And so God is the real creator and he is the sustainer and he is life and joy and everything we long for and evil comes along, our heart comes along and tries to produce counterfeits, but they're not the real thing. We'll place our faith in them, but they will never provide. It's the thought that something other than God, whether it's religion or rebellion or science or government or self, we can actually depend on to save and complete us. And listen to me, if the pandemic has not revealed anything else, it's revealed this. That if you place your faith in anything of the world, it can be taken away, shifted, or changed in an instant. And and this is what we have seen. If everything that you find life in, listen to me, can be shaken, and then it is in fact shaken, then what are you left with? See, your idols can only fulfill you to the extent that they can provide for you and everything on earth can be gone in a moment, changed in a moment, shifted in a moment. Only God is eternal. Only he has created us to have life and only in finding life in him can we have everything that we long for now and in eternity. 
And in him, he begins to shift our desires. He gives us a new personhood, a new heart, new longings, new, new everything that we used to desire. We now look to him and want to walk in his way by his will. This is what the Holy Spirit does in us. We begin in God to crave God's word, to crave community with other believers, to place our faith in him and to walk in him and to reveal him in everything that we do, to honor him even when it is hard and to repent when we walk away from him with the knowledge that he will be faithful to forgive us and that he is always with us and he is always exactly what we are looking for in every situation. So, so it's not, as I said, that we do the things that God desires us to do out of duty. We do them out of love and desire because God actually comes in and not only saves us, but transforms our hearts to long for him. I remember the first time that this ever happened for me. I was in college and, and, and this is a time that God actually, I, I felt, spoke to me and called me into ministry. But there was just this time when everything of God was just so weighty on me. And I used to go out every Friday and Saturday night and hang out with all the guys on my, my hall in my dorm room. And, and I just remember one Friday night, they came knocking, hey, let's go. And I was like, no, I'm going to stay here. And all I secretly wanted to do was read my Bible. That's what I did the whole time. Right? The Holy Spirit needed to work on me a little bit more, so I lied in that moment. I was like, I don't wanna, I'm not going to go. I don't feel good or whatever. Like, I didn't want them to know I was just reading my Bible because that would be weird. But then over time, I just continued to desire that and dive into God's word. It was a longing. It was a shift in who I was. Everything about me had begun to change, and I just desired and craved the truths of God and to be faithful to those things. And, and over time, I began to see some of those guys come to faith and, and grow in faithfulness to God. As the Holy Spirit worked on me and I was able to say, hey, I'm not going to do that or I'm not going to do this because I want to honor God. And at first, they were like, what are you talking about? But over time, God used that not only in my life, but in their life. And faithfulness to God, putting our faith in him and being saved by his grace will transform our hearts and we will long for him. We will desire him more and more and we will reveal everything of life that we have in him. But listen to me, God is never going to force feed you something of him that you do not want. If you really place your faith in him, you will long for him. You will want him. You will desire him. Even though there might be times of difficulty in your life where it's just like, I don't feel him and I don't know and I don't really want to read his word and I don't really want to be a part of his body. But ultimately, you will know that that is what is best and you will be faithful to what he is doing in you because he has saved you and is transforming you and you realize that life is only found in him. And so your faithfulness will be drawn to to what is good, even when you don't want to do what is right. See, this is the way that the Spirit works in us. We don't want to be rebellious anymore. We're not giving up something that we find life in. We're finding life, and then we're living the rest of everything that we do to reveal that life in everything else that is a part of our lives. Because these fruits of the Spirit, they're the characteristics of Jesus. They are who He is. And as he lives and dwells in us, we desire to know our joy and freedom in him. So, so here's the question I want to spend just the last couple of minutes together on. Okay, many of us might say, okay, I get it. The gospel is true. I need to place my faith in Jesus. Jesus saves me by his grace. I, I walk in him by his grace. And he transforms my heart to desire these things. But how do I live faithfully in faithfulness to the faith that God has given me? How do I? Because it's hard, is it not? There are constantly things of the world that are begging for our attention and our worship, and it's very difficult not to walk away and live faithful to those things as though they will satisfy us in a way that only God can. So how do I understand that faith alone comes through grace and what Christ has done for me and salvation is found in him and in him alone, but then walk faithfully in that salvation for all joy in any environment, in any circumstance? Because that's the difficulty we have, and that's why I want us to see what Paul says in 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who are able to teach others also. So what does he say here? That if we want to walk in faithfulness to who we are in Christ and salvation, 
to experience the joy of everything that God has purchased for us and positionally declares us to be by his work and his work alone. Do we have to go out and just try harder to do better? Is it a list of things that we have to go out there and pursue to do to honor God so that he will love us and we will grow in him and we will understand him and we'll have joy in him and and as he shifts our environment to match what we think that we really want? No, he says, by grace, you will be strengthened. See, God saves, sustains, he transforms, he grows. But then he says, there is this work, there's this process that we do in our salvation, not for our salvation, to walk in. So the hard work of Christianity, what he's going to say is, is not that we try harder to do better for salvation, but we have salvation by grace alone through Christ. And then the hard work of Christianity is to actually trust God and live in it in everything that we are and everything that we do. The hard part is the faithfulness to the faith that he gives us. And so look what he says to do. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilians' pursuits since his aim is to, place the one he, who, uh, is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. And then he says, think of these things. Ponder on these things. Meditate on these things. For the Lord will give you understanding of everything. So it's by his grace. And then when we begin to pursue to walk in faithfulness and we think about the things of God and his grace, then in that pursuit, he will reveal to us his grace in deeper and deeper ways. And we will be able to live in who we are in him and everything that we do more and more clearly in every environment and every circumstance. And he reminds us of what to remember. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as priest in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy and true. And this is believed to maybe be an old hymn. If we had died with him, we also live with him. So in the flesh, we can also live in the spirit. Verse 12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. That if we live faithfully to who we are in Christ and his salvation by grace, then we will be with him for all of eternity, all things made new, the perfect community that we were created to have. But, warning, if we deny him, he will also deny us. But then he reminds us, if we are faithless but in him, then listen to me, God is always faithful for he cannot deny himself. So what we see in this text just really quickly is that salvation belongs to God alone and we are saved by his grace alone through faith that he has done all the work. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. And then we daily rely on, preach the gospel to ourselves, teach the truth to ourselves, depend on who he is. We are faithful to what he has done in our lives without compromise to what is good and what is true. And then we begin to live in the joy of God and the identity that we have in him. It is revealed in all that we are and all that we do. I love this beautiful truth. And then he gives us three quick ways to do that. Look, look what he says, verses one through seven, three examples. He says, to live out this identity in Christ, we must live faithfully like a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. I think he picks these three things purposely because all three of these are super tough, right? All of them work under another's authority and every single one of them need others to help them produce what they cannot produce alone. But look at the differences. First, he says, we have to live like a soldier. We understand as followers of Christ that we're at war. If we do not understand that we're at war with the flesh, then the flesh will eat us alive. See, a soldier has singular focus. They can understand that the other things of the world are important, but I see them through the lens of who I am in God. I have singular focus on my identity. 
So I understand that I am at war with the flesh. I have singular focus in everything that I do on who I am in God. I am listening to his voice as a soldier listens for the voice of his general. And I follow what he tells me to do. I don't, I don't stop until there is victory. So we must, if we desire to live faithfully to who we are in Christ in salvation, to know joy in every circumstance and environment, then we must, like a soldier, understand that we are at war with the flesh for, to live faithfully in who we are in God. Then he says, we need to live like an athlete. Athletes are disciplined. They're in shape. They can do things that, that we can't do because they're prepared. Like, like we think we can do it. I don't know if you're like me, but when you watch a football game and somebody draws a pass, you automatically go, I would have caught that. And there's absolutely no way. I would not even have gotten in the vicinity of the ball. Right? So an athlete disciplines themselves to be prepared for the game. And then it says the athlete cannot win unless they play by the rules. So they are disciplined to understand the rules of the game. And if we want to live faithfully in the things of Christ, have joy in every circumstance and environment, then we must be disciplined to know our God. We must be disciplined to understand his word, to depend on him in prayer, to know him in deeper and deeper ways in the way that he has created us to live so that we know the pathway he has created for us to live in victory on. And then finally, he says, we have to be like the farmer. Now, here's what I know about farming. Nothing. Like, I'm not a farmer. I don't like farming. I'm afraid of camping out. Like, a lot of you guys, if you're in the city, you just crave the fresh air of the woods. If I'm in the woods, I just want to be surrounded by buildings. Like, that's my safe zone. All right? But what I do know is farmers work extremely hard from sunup to sundown. And perhaps more than these other two examples, they are also more dependent on outside forces than anything else on earth because they can work as hard as they can possibly work, but the farmer cannot produce rain. The farmer understands that he can't stop the wind or the snow from coming or make the sun shine. So they are keenly aware, I have to work extremely hard, but there are outside circumstances that have to come along for what, I'm, what seed I'm throwing down to actually produce fruit. And so here's what I need us to understand. We have to be like a soldier. We have to know that we are at war to live faithfully in the things of God. We have to live like an athlete who is prepared in the things of God to know the pathway of freedom in which to walk if we want to walk in faithfulness. But we also have to be dependent like a farmer. That I'm going to go to God in prayer. I'm going to trust him. I know that all of my work is planting seed, but he is the one that produces the crop. He's the one who produces all of the life that I long for. And then he says, remember that we find ourselves in the gospel truth, not our own work. God is not looking for people to impress him, but to trust him. Our faithfulness is found in him alone. He says in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you will bear nothing. So listen to me. I think that there are probably some of us in here, maybe some watching online, that have not placed our faith in Jesus. And what you need to know this morning is that Jesus is the answer for everything you're searching for. And you need to today place your faith in him. Know freedom for the first time. And then you will finally have your eyes open to what you need to live faithfully towards. Some of us as followers of Christ, we believe in God, but we have compromised in many ways. And maybe this pandemic has just put the perfect storm into place where compromise has just creeped in. And I want to challenge you this morning to repent of all of the compromise and turn back to God and not only find your faith in him and your salvation in him, but live in the joy of that salvation by faithfully living in the identity that he has purchased for you. And maybe this morning you just need to take time to repent of the compromise to focus back on him. Because listen, we need to be, we long to be, we desire to be faithful men and women who reveal him in all that we do as the answer to all that we long for.